So we're now going to welcome Noor Sahib Awesome. All right. So she is a fourth year student in the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts, um, Boston's clinical psychology PhD program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How does this connection to religion, this 
religious identity or this religiosity, whether that's a behavioral ritualistic practice or whether that's in how I see myself, how does this potentially um, buffer this negative or the, the negative impact of a culture of stress? And for me, I found that a lot of times it made it really easy to have this compass of, okay, well, my parents say this, my friends say this, and the Quran or my religion says this. So maybe that could be a guiding kind of force for me. And at other times, I think it was very confusing and hard to kind of figure out. So I wanted to look at um, how, what, what's found in the research, what's found in the literature that, um, how is this playing a role for other people, particularly the Muslim graduate parents. So let's talk a little bit about the constructs. So, sorry, guys. So talking about religiosity, I'm sure that we've all kind of gone through learning about this several times today, and um, I think in the keynote address we we got to hear a lot about it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways that I learned about it in the lit review. So what's complicated about this construct is that people are defining it in the research in the research several different ways. So there's not necessarily one agreed upon. Um, understanding what religiosity is, but also there's so many dimensions and components of religiosity. Is it the behavioral practice? Is it engaging in a congregation or an organization? Is it your identity? Is it how you feel connected to it internally? Or is it the values you hold that are related to it? So this was a kind of complicated piece of trying to answer my question because of the way that it was studied, so complicated and um, so, so multidimensional. And so broadly, it's been defined as these phenomena um, that incorporate this acknowledgement and this desire to maintain a relationship with the transcendent, um, who we call the love, which may include kind of traditional institutionalized um, behavioral approaches to enacting that and maintaining that relationship, as well as other characteristics um, that, that demonstrate that we have some beliefs about the supernatural or transcendent, and how we then engage in behaviors related to this belief or these, um, this relationship with the transcendent. So apart from that, there's also kind of this, these affective, cognitive, and behavioral components. So um, cognitive meaning kind of the degree to which we align with rules or regulations or how we think about our religion, but also affective, which is how we feel about these beliefs, how we value um, certain things or certain practices or certain aspects. And then behavioral, which is um, our practices, our rituals, the things we engage in um, in a behavioral way. So as you can see, there's all these dimensions and different aspects that came up in the research, which really complicated me answering my question. And another piece was that there are also a lot of related constructs, so things like religious coping, religious involvement, um, religiousness, spirituality, so a lot of these definitions. And one of the ones I'm going to talk about today is religious coping. Um, so this is understood as a specific mode of coping that's inherently derived from religious beliefs, practices, um, experiences, emotions, and religious um, relationships. And then we're going to talk about acculturation, a very controversial construct in itself. Again, the idea that um, individuals adapt and shift with regard to culture after sustained contact with different cultural groups and contexts, and how this then shifts their, um, their functioning in cognitive domains, affective domains, behavioral, how they think, how they feel, where their values. Um, so that's one of the key constructs. And then culture of stress, so this, this state that we enter when the demands both internal, both external, um, of cultural adaptation exceed kind of our capacities and the resources that we have. So, so I'll tell you a little bit about the themes that I found. So, not surprisingly or shockingly, religiosity bears a strong positive influence on um, general well-being, which we learned today in the keynote. Um, I think that really brought it home, so I guess I'm, I'm going to reiterate that a little bit for you. But, this is kind of a, a unsurprising um, piece of information that I think is a key part of what I'm asking in terms of whether it impacts the culture of stress and managing the culture of stress. But what's interesting is that there's other components of religiosity that some of the research has highlighted is actually potentially not help, helpful the way that we understand it or the way that we use it. So what are those pieces and how do those um, how are those implicated in our clinical work and also in our own lives and how we interact with you know people in our community. Um, so, another piece, also not surprising, is that the evidence is pretty clear about the fact that there are detrimental effects of cultural stress, um, particularly on the mental health of Muslim Americans, but also immigrants and other individuals in general, other immigrants in general. Um, and then also, for the sake of time, I won't get too much into this, 
But something really important to note, and I won't have much time to go into it, but it's the fact that as Muslim Americans, we are an extremely heterogeneous group of people. Our intersecting identities are all going to play a role in how each of these factors um, apply to us, right? So there is ethnicity, race, gender, um, not to mention you know, just family culture, other pieces of our experience that are going to make this different. And a lot of research doesn't really parse that apart and consider all of those things. So it's something to consider. Um, but also, apart from those things, how we experience discrimination and how that further exacerbates some of this culture of stress. Um, and that may really depend on how we appear or how people are quoting us. And so those other identities certainly are relevant in some ways. So I won't get to go into that too much, but I think it's important to acknowledge. Um, and then finally, what I found is that, yes, maybe it's possible that religiosity does play a role in being protective um, in the face of the culture of stress and the negative kind of psychological impact that it does have, but we don't really know how. It's really unclear because all the dimensions of religiosity that have been explored and studied and the different ways that they've been conceptualized or the ways that we've not conceptualized them or not considered them. Um, so let me do a little bit of information on some of the studies that I found that can highlight or illustrate some of these. So the first thing I mentioned, which is that um, the literature is supporting this idea that religiosity is a connection to religiosity, or religion is positively associated with well-being. So these are a few um, excerpts from reviews. And basically, um, actually going back, the first review is um, specifically focusing not on Muslim Americans, but just a general population and how religiosity or connection to religion um, could impact depressive symptoms or depressive disorders. And so essentially they found that people who have no religious affiliation, again, a different construct, not exactly the same that we're talking about, um, but that this particular affiliation or involvement in religion um, allows people to be at uh, a, high, a lower risk if they have the connection to religiosity, but a higher risk of elevated depressive symptoms or uh, incidents of depression um, in the case that they don't have this. So bringing home that same point, in another review of adolescents, they found that higher levels of religiosity and spirituality, of course self-reported, um, found that people that reported that also reported better mental health. And then, again, same kind of concept again and again, greater religious involvement in another review was associated with better self-reported mental health. And finally, in another study, um, they actually found that Muslim participants who use positive religious coping, so that's thinking about um, coping in a way, let me tell you actually how they defined it. Um, so positive religious coping can look like engaging in activities that reflect a secure relationship with God, a belief that there's greater meaning or purpose, um, to be found in a sense of spiritual connectedness with God and others. Whereas negative religious coping can be um, activities or perspectives that reflect kind of an ominous or darker view of the world or a negative view of the world and a religious struggle to kind of find and conserve and maintain that meaning or purpose. And so they actually found that negative religious coping can have the potential to be harmful, but that Muslim participants are more likely to be using positive religious coping. So I think that's a little relevant piece that we can talk about. And so highlighting again um, the theme that religiosity can play a role in mental health symptoms, specifically, um, I think this one looks at depression. So just noting the sample again, this is Muslim and Christian identified um, Arab American adults specifically. And kind of the key relevant findings here is that lower intrinsic religiosity was associated with higher um, depressive scores. And I want to tell you how they define intrinsic religiosity. So it was understood as one's personal um, religious commitment that was based on internal motivations um, and traditional religious beliefs, whereas extrinsic religiosity was um, kind of being motivated by external rewards like social approval or acceptance. Um, and so they found that lower intrinsic religiosity was the thing that um, led to higher depression uh, scores and higher culture of stress, higher depression scores. So again, just bringing home this point that culture of stress can really have this impact. And in another study, um, this is highlighting the way that culture of stress contributes to um, negative mental health, but also how religious coping could potentially play a stress buffering role. So in this one, again, you'll notice that it's primarily, it's not primarily Arab American, it's a completely Arab American sample, but it's adolescents, and it's again, primarily Muslim. Um, but we also have first and second generation immigrants here. So second generation being defined as you come here before the age of six, and first generation coming here as an adult. Um, so here we know, or we find again, that higher culture of stress is associated with higher levels of depression, internalizing and externalizing symptoms. Internalizing is 
kind of endorsing ideas like I cry alone or I feel guilty uh, or it's externalizing is I, I fight with others, I get angry at others, these types of symptoms that they're measuring in adolescence, so different developmental phase. And higher levels of religious coping uh, were associated with lower levels of all those same symptoms. And having religious support, so a community that can offer you support or feel like connected to a community, was again associated with lower levels of all those same symptoms. So essentially what we're finding here is that some aspect or some component or connection um, to religiosity is related to some reduced psychological distress. And a culture of stress is, is related to having increased psychological distress. So I think, again, the key here is there's these different constructs, like religious coping. How are you using religion to cope with stress rather than just the fact that you identify with the faith or that you feel that you're Muslim or that you claim that you're Muslim, but um, what is the way that you're coping with that stress? And then religious support. This is, this is having social support in the context of your faith. So these are different pieces that we need to consider when we're talking about religiosity. Um, and then in another study, they looked at the ways that acculturation and culture stress and religiosity are related to mental health. And again, this is Arab American adolescence. I actually think this is a subset. Um, oh no, it's not. Ignore that. So again, we find here higher levels of religiosity are related to lower levels of culture of stress. So maybe there is this buffering piece, and then um, these offing things right here. So being a member of a religious community, receiving support from God, practicing religion could be protective factors in the face of a culture of stress for, again, Arab American adolescents, all Muslim. And so this is what they found. And again, I think this is driving home the point that I've kind of mentioned from this week in the So another similar study, that's a subset. This is a subset from the study before. And so in this, they actually looked at, they used like a multidimensional measure, and they used two particular components, which are organizational religious practices, um, and private religious practices. So organizational is I go to the mosque and I pray, and private is I pray on my own. And they're measuring kind of the frequency of how often people are doing this, which again, in my opinion, is not necessarily how I measure religiosity or how religious you are, is how frequently you're going to the mosque. Um, so again, these questions of what does this really mean and what are the implications. So they found that organizational religious practices actually contributed to lower or was associated with lower levels of culture of stress, but this was not actually true for private religious practices. So maybe there's that social support factor again there. Um, and that organizational religious practices were not associated with internalizing symptoms. So again, those um, kind of personal internal psychological symptoms of feeling sad and guilty. Um, so again, not all components are necessarily relevant to um, being protective for us or our mental health, and not all components are related to, kind of, or are related to um, experiencing higher levels of culture. So this last one is my favorite. It's the only qualitative study I came across. Does that mean it's the only one? Thank you. Um, but this was looking at post-migration experiences of recent Pakistani Muslim um, first-generation immigrants. I think these young women were, yeah, they were um, ages 15 to 18. And so it's kind of a prominent theme that they found in the qualitative study was that these um, particular women mentioned things like going to mosque regularly for prayer and kind of explicitly commented on how this is um, a source of relief for any stress and the ability to connect with other people was also a source of relief and stress. So I wish that I had more kind of qualitative studies to bring up these anecdotes, but I think this is a perfect kind of example of how this can be supportive and protective in a way to buffer um, some of the stress that immigrants are experiencing. So clinical implications, the fun part. So I think the big thing is um, not only assessing and evaluating for acculturation experiences and a culture of stress, but being able to offer some psychoeducation and naming these things as what they are. I don't think I ever had anyone tell me, oh, well, hello, you're from another country, and so are your parents, and so maybe it's a little complicated to navigate everything you're navigating. I never really got that information, so I think having, um, being aware as clinicians, as Muslim clinicians, but also, um, being able to assess that, but also share that information and offer that general uh, psycho ed on what this could mean or what this could look like. And that it's a natural and normal part of kind of going through um, negotiating these different cultural experiences and, and holding these different identities. Um, the other piece is um, actually really creating some space for the different components of religion, not just like do you pray or do you identify as Muslim, but what are kind of the more complex layers of how people are interpreting their faith or how it's playing a role in their life? Are they engaging in negative religious coping? 
are they are they actually doing like everything that's happening is a punishment from God and so they don't deserve to be happy? Like the things that we even talked about um, in the keynote today, which I think a lot of those concepts and those thoughts are um, held uh, by by many Muslim individuals, at least who I know. So I think being able to acknowledge and explore those things clinically um, would be really important. And then um, considering those kind of, as I mentioned, the kind of negative or potentially harmful components, the extrinsic religiosity, um, the motivation for being connected to religion in the way that um, we're seeing it as getting social approval or being accepted or being connected and not really necessarily an internal desire for religion. So are those things playing a role in people's experiences? And then I think as we're um, not really incorporating the complexity of the religiosity into case conceptualizations, but in my training so far, I'm in my fourth year, I've never been told to ask people about any religious or um, spirituality um, kind of questions in an intake. We don't really talk about that. I've actually been trained, I feel like, pretty well. I've talked a lot about like how you bring race into the room or ethnicity into the room and how you create a comfortable, safe space for people to talk about those topics, of race-related stress or discrimination. Um, but I haven't really done much of this, and I myself identify as Muslim. So I think there's a taboo in academia and our training that doesn't really leave room for us to talk about being Muslim or being of anything for that matter. And so I think um, keeping that in mind as we assess and, and do intakes and talk to people and, and allow them to know that we're willing to talk about this and kind of incorporate it into their treatment or just how we're um, talking about them. And then I think a big piece of awareness of our own biases, given that I find most of us in here identify as Muslim and, and might be clinicians, um, we have our own interpretation and our own version of Islam, and we have our own way um, that we negotiate all of our different identities. So being aware of our own biases and how we bring those into the room if we do have Muslim clients, um, I think is really important. So that's one piece. And then we talked about this in various other sessions. Um, today, but reducing mental health stigma, uh, I think again normalizing that it makes sense for you to feel stressed or anxious or depressed that you know you're trying to negotiate all these various contexts and spaces um, and still hold on to your different identities or your values. Um, that it's that it's normal and that it's part of the experience and that, that other people are experiencing it too, um, and that it's okay to then come talk about it somewhere. And then um, I think another piece is the role of imams and clergy always. People are going to the mosque, people are getting their connection or their social support there. Um, so how do we talk with um, clergy and imams and other individuals who are at the mosque about, again, educating and offering this information or even sharing their um, complexities of how they navigated religion or how they had a moment where they really questioned what they believed or how they um, connected with their faith or in moments of weakness where they didn't really abide by what was right for them. So again, creating space for the taboo topics or the, the things that are so stigmatized that we're afraid to talk about and, and allowing, um, especially adolescents, and thank you, and um, you know, people of different development phases to, to recognize that this, this can be part of your process and your experience. Um, so going through some of the gaps and limitations, um, I think a big struggle that I had was the oper operationalization of religiosity. Um, and other constructs, and I think as much as I can be frustrated by the varying um, definitions of religiosity, that is that is um, inherently what religiosity is. It's a complicated, complex um, idea and concept and experience that is human and therefore really complex. So I think what makes it hard in terms of research is that um, it's, it's hard to answer a question about religiosity when everyone is defining it and measuring it in a very different way. Um, so I think getting to some place where we can have something a little bit um, more universally defined or understood and um, would be very helpful. Um, and then of course, you know, having these related constructs that are important for us to know about and, and be able to look at the different dimensions, but realizing that, um, again, it's hard to answer my particular question when people are looking, when a lot of the research is looking at very different constructs, and so I can't really come out to you and say, well, yeah, religiosity is certainly protective in the face of a culture of stress. There are pieces of religiosity that are, and that's kind of the answer that I got. Um, the measures vary really significantly, and a lot of them are not nuanced enough and are not really acknowledging the actual lived experience of people. Um, some of the occultative stress um, measures are saying, you know, having people endorse items like, it's because of my accent, I have a hard time connecting with people. That can be true for a lot of people, and for a big second generation immigrants, that's not really part of their experience. Um, so there's a lot of, sometimes, I think the measures are, are not really getting at the lived experience of what's happening for people. So, so really, I think 
that's another part for research for us to really improve. Um, I think I said this part already. And then again, as you guys saw, some of my um, some of the samples from the studies that I mentioned are primarily Arab American, which is great, but we also need to incorporate um, other ethnic groups and racial groups, and just largely, you know, research um, on Muslim Americans in general is just not enough. We need more. Um, the other thing was most of the studies that I mentioned are cross-sectional. I would love to work on qualitative research and get more of that voice amplified of um, individuals who are going through this and what's actually happening for them, um, and kind of the, the self-report nature in the, in the cross-sectional design is another thing. I think, you know, we all have social desirability bias. Um, I know that I did a study once and had to answer questions about how many times I prayed and how, how much I, like, cared about my religion, and I really increased the number, and it wasn't true, and so incorporating uh, measures that, you know, account for that and, and consider those factors because I think that's pretty relevant. And then just improving our samples generally. Um, so yeah, we want to, I think I've basically said all of these things. We want to improve our definition, our op operationalization, I've never been able to say that word. Um, have a more diverse methodology, um, measure the social desirability bias, and yeah, basically said all of these. The other last piece is um, incorporating more variables to understand the mechanisms by which religiosity is actually helping, or what are the other confounding factors and the other nuances to these experiences, and, and that's not um, often measured and explored. I think we're, we're looking at this in a very reductionistic way and not considering so many of the other interesting 